Welcome back, everyone, to the God's Peculiar People podcast. This episode is a little bit different than our normal structure. What happened was I came across some interesting stories about Moody and Sankey. And as I was reading through, I was trying to, to compile an episode about different, just interesting, like, opposition that they had or just interesting stories. And I'm going to do that episode sometime in the future. But I came across, from both perspectives, a a book written by um, Sankey and a book written about Moody, that give what happened, their experiences, what happened to them during the Chicago Fire. Now, this is important because this, uh, the Chicago Fire, that's where Moody and Sankey were working. They were based in Chicago, and the Chicago Fire took out Farley Hall, which is where they were working. That's where they were having a meeting the night of the Chicago fire. It just gives us a little bit of, I guess, a better insight into these men's lives, what what they remembered or what happened during the Chicago fire. So I thought that'd be interesting to, um, I'm going to, it's nothing that I created. I'm just going to read from um, books, the excerpts that I found about this. I thought it would be kind of an interesting thing to uh, read. Hopefully you will enjoy it, find it interesting. So this will be first Sankey's perspective and then uh, Moody's perspective. And like I said, there's so much we could talk about Moody and Sankey. I have have a lot of different ideas. There's some other... uh, We didn't even get with Moody. We didn't even get to his time founding schools. We we didn't even touch on that really. And there's more about Sankey as well. We could discuss um, some things that happened during the meetings, his his later life. But we're going to be moving on from Moody and Sankey next week. We'll come back to them at some point, possibly after the new year, unless I get inspiration. But we'll talk about them later. Next week, we'll actually talk about someone who is connected with them, which I did not realize. What's been fun about this is just seeing all the connections. People who uh, lived at the same time as Moody and Sankey that I didn't just, you hear the names, you, you read about people individually many times, but then to see the connections of who could have worked with Moody. That, that's, that's someone, not next week, but in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about someone who could have taken Senki's job, uh, who actually was offered it first, uh, which is very interesting. Just seeing how all these people connect and intertwine is a lot of fun. So, uh, like I said, there's more to Moody and Senki's story, but we'll come back to that later. Um, there's more people that I want to highlight before the end of the year, and I just want to do a little more research about their lives on the road and the sea before we dive into that more. So, expect to see them back again soon, both maybe together a little bit or individually, but they will be back. And I want to apologize, I just realized I said Farley Hall, it's Farwell Hall. Sorry, wrong wrong pronunciation of the hall. I just, I saw it written and I was like, oh yeah, it's not Farley, it's Farwell. Added an extra sound in there. All right, well, let's begin with Sankey's account of the Chicago fire. So it begins, Sunday evening, October 8th, 1871, we were holding a meeting in Farwell Hall, which was crowded to the doors. At the close of his address, Mr. Moody asked me to sing a solo, and standing by the great organ at the rear of the platform, I began the old familiar hymn, Today the Savior Calls. By the time I had reached the third verse, Today the Savior Calls, for refuge fly, the storm of justice falls, and death is nigh. My voice was drowned by the loud noise of the fire engines rushing past the hall, and the tolling of bells, among which we could hear, ever and anon, the deep sullen tones of the great city bell in the steeple of the old courthouse close at hand, ringing out a general alarm. Tremendous confusion was heard in the streets, and Mr. Moody decided to close the meeting at once, for the audience was becoming restless and alarmed. As the people dispersed, I went with Mr. Moody down the small back stairway, leading into the old arcade court, and from our position there we watched the reflection of the fire, half a mile away, on the west side of the city, as it cast its ominous glare against the sky. After a few moments we separated, I to go over the river to where the fire was raging, and he to his home in the north side. We did not meet again for more than two months. On reaching the scene of the fire, I found a whole block of small framed buildings burning fiercely. I insisted in tearing down some board fence to try to keep the fire from spreading to the adjoining territory. While thus engaged, the wind from the southwest had arisen almost to a hurricane, and the flying embers from the falling buildings were quickly caught up and carried high upon the roofs of the houses adjoining, which were soon in flames. Thus the fire spread from building to building and from block to block, until it became evident that the city was doomed. All this time, the fire was moving towards Farwell Hall, in the business center of the city. I now gave up the fight, and made haste to recross the river, hurrying back to my quarters, my living room and office, in the Farwell Hall building. 
The fire followed so rapidly that several times I had to shake the falling embers from my coat. Arriving at the hall, I gathered up a number of belongings which I especially wished to save, and placing them close to the door of my office, went out to find a conveyance so as to transfer them to a place of safety. It was now between one and two o'clock in the morning, and not a carriage or truck could be found. While still looking for a conveyance, I saw in the distance, coming up Clark Street, a horse attached to an express wagon, running at full speed, without a driver, ten or fifty men running after it, trying to capture the animal. I made a dash to the flying steed, but in turning from one street into another he slipped and fell, and in a moment a crowd of men were on top of him, each claiming the right of possession. Not caring to share in the contest, I returned to the hall, and commenced the task of carrying my effects towards Lake Michigan, half a mile distance. On the way to the lake I passed the present location of the Palmer House, then being erected, the foundation of which had only been built to the level of the street. Believing that the room's underground passages could afford a temporary place of security for some of my things, I walked on a plank down to the cellar, and hid two large valises in the darkest corner I could find. As yet, only a few people were moving out of their homes in this section of the city, and as I noticed the seeming indifference of those who had came to the windows of their houses, I called out to them to escape for their lives, as the city was doomed to destruction. Some became alarmed, others only laughed. I returned to the hall for another load of my belongings, and after securing all I could carry, started in a more direct route for the lake, the streets being lighted up by the glare of the oncoming conflagration. After getting about halfway to the shore, I stopped and deposited my burden on the front steps of a fine residence I was passing, thinking I would soon return and find them there. Again, for the third time, I went back to my rooms, and gathering up a few articles, started for the stone steps. I found, however, on reaching the house that the things I had left were covered several feet deep with other people's belongings, and I never saw them again. By this time the people were fully awake, rushing to the street, or anxiously looking out their windows and from the tops of their houses in the direction of the fire. I could not help thinking of the Bible story of the destruction of the cities of the plain in long ago, as many still made light of those who said the city would be destroyed. The air was filled with flying sparks of fire, resembling a spring snowstorm, when the sky is filled with huge falling flakes. As I pressed on, two men carrying a sick man on a stretcher overtook me. After passing a short distance ahead, they stopped and laid him by the side of the street, as the invalid, being quite sure the city would not be destroyed, did not wish to be carried further. As soon as the carriers had been paid off and discharged, I employed them to assist me in carrying my effects to the lakeside. But before we reached our destination, and looking westward, they saw the fire was sweeping through the southeastern section of the city where they lived. Dropping my goods in the middle of the street, and without waiting for compensation, they rushed away to secure their own homes. Again, I secured help, and at last reached the lake, where I deposited my trunks and possessions close by the edge of the water, with the thought that if the flames came to the edge of the lake, I would walk into the water and be saved from the heat. Remembering my first attempt at carrying my goods away from Farwell Hall, I returned to the Palmer House block to secure, if possible, my first cargo, very much fearing that the things would not be there when I reached the place, as I thought some night wanderer might have noticed my leaving them, and appropriated them to his own use. Much to my joy, I found them still there, and carried them away to the lake. By this time I was greatly exhausted, and much famished for want of water, that along the shore being not fit to drink. I asked another refugee, who was in like case with myself, watching his little store of precious things, if he would look out for mine, while I returned into the city to get some water to drink. The man consenting, I went back to Wabash Avenue, one of the finest residential streets in the city, and entering one of the large houses, asked if I might have some water. I was told to go into the rear of the building, and get all I wished. I found a faucet, but on attempting to draw water, air rushed out instead. This was my first intimation that the waterworks two miles to the northward, had been destroyed. A few minutes later I heard a terrific explosion which seemed to shake the city. I was told that the city gas works had blown up. Things began to look very desperate. No water, no light in the houses, and the city in flames. I made my way back again to the lake and, wrapped in, wrapping myself in a great overcoat, lay down behind one of the large trunks which I had saved. Thus sheltered from the wind, I slept for an hour. On waking I could hear the rush and roar of the fire coming nearer and nearer. The sun, slowly rising out of the waters of the lake, seemed like a red fireball. The wind had not fallen, and huge waves were breaking on the shore at my feet. I now felt that I must have water to drink, and after wandering along the shore for some distance, found some small rowboats, and asked a man nearby 
who seemed to be their owner, if I might have one to go out to the lake for fresh water. Yes, he said, if you can manage the boat, you can have it, as we are not likely to have much more boating in this section for some time to come. So I took possession of one, and rode down to where my goods were deposited. Rolling them on board, I made my way out into the lake, passing through the piling on which the railway was built in front of the city. After getting my boat through the piling, I rode out far enough to find fresh water. Then, tying my boat to some timbers that were being used for the erection of a new water break, I climbed upon the pile of lumber, and for several hours watched the destruction of the city. Every few minutes a loud explosion was heard. I afterwards learned that these were caused by the blowing of the buildings, by order of General Sheridan, who was in the city at the time, so as to form a barrier against the fire and prevent its spreading to the southward. It was interesting to watch the tramps and thieves carrying away on their backs large bales of silk and satin goods which they had taken from the burning stores in the wholesale district. Most of them followed the railway track southward, not knowing that at the place where the track reached the land a company of fire insurance agents were waiting with open arms to relieve them of their burdens. The day wore away, but the city was still burning, and as the sun was sinking in the west, a song came into my mind which I had been singing a few days before in Mr. Moody's large Sunday school on the north side, and I sang it through as I sat there, waves beating about me. The first verse was as follows. Dark is the night, and cold the wind is blowing. Nearer and nearer comes the breaker's roar. Where shall I go, or whither fly for refuge? Hide me, O oh my father, till the storm is o'er. I finally determined to get back to land, but was not aware of the fact that the riding of my boat upon the waves had almost sawn asunder the line which had been attached to the timber. As I jumped into the boat, the line broke, and I was swept out into the lake, the waves sweeping over my little craft. For a moment I was in real danger of being lost, but I soon had the boat under control, and after a few moments of hard work reached the shore in safety. I then secured a drayman, who for the sum of ten dollars agreed to carry me and my effects to the unburned end of the Fort Wayne and Chicago Railroad, if he could find it. He succeeded. I checked my goods for the, my home in the east, secured some refreshment at a nearby restaurant, and then went back into the burnt district. Farwell Hall was gone, and every building in that part of the city had disappeared. The paved streets, covered with hot bricks and long coils of burnt and twisted telegraph wire, told something of the awful story. Most of the substance of these great buildings had actually been carried away by the hot air into the water of Lake Michigan. After seeing something of the fearful destruction wrought upon flagation, I made my way through the heated streets to the railway, and took an outgoing train for my home in Pennsylvania. As we left the city, it seemed as though the whole country was on fire. In all directions we could see huge banks of flame sweeping across the prairies, and the air was filled to suffocation with smoke. I was soon able to telegraph home of my safety and speedy return. It seemed as though this would end my work in Chicago. Following is Moody's account of the story and of his last service in Farwell Hall. I had been for five nights preaching on the life of Christ. I took him from the cradle and followed him up the judgment hall, and on that occasion I consider I made as great a blunder as ever I made in my life. It was upon that memorable night in October, and the courthouse bell was sounding an alarm of fire, but I paid no attention to it. You know, we were accustomed to hearing the fire bell often, and it did not disturb us much when it sounded. I finished the sermon upon, What shall I do with Jesus? And I said to the audience, Now I want you to take the question with you and think over it. And next Sunday, I want you to come back and tell me what you are going to do with it. What a mistake. It seems now as if Satan was in my mind when I said this. Since then, I have never dared to give an audience a week to think on their salvation. If they were lost, they might rise up in judgment against me. Now is the accepted time. We went downstairs to the other meeting, and I remember when Mr. Sankey was singing, and how his voice rang when he came to that pleading verse, Today the Savior calls, for refuge fly, the storm of justice falls, and death is nigh. After the meeting we went home. I remember going down the street with the young man, who was probably in the hall tonight, and saw the glare of flames. I said to the young man, This means ruin to Chicago. About one o'clock Farwell Hall went. Soon the church in which I had preached went down, and everything was scattered. I never saw that audience again. My friends, we don't know what may happen tomorrow, but there is one thing I do know, and that is, if you take the gift, you are saved. If you have eternal life, you need not fear fire, death, or sickness. Let disease or death come, you can shout triumphantly over the grave, if you have Christ. My friend, 
What are you going to do with him tonight? Will you decide now? That is Moody's own account. Here is a another account. On October 8th, he preached to the largest congregation that he had ever dressed in that city, having taken for his text, What then shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? After preaching, as he or talking, as he did not call it preaching then, with all his power of entreaty, presenting Christ as Savior and Redeemer, he said, I wish you would now take this text home with you, and turn it over in your minds during the week. And next Sabbath we will come to Calvary, and the cross, and we will decide what to do with Jesus of Nazareth. What a mistake, he said, in relating the story to a large audience in Chicago, on the 22nd anniversary of the Great Fire in that city in 1871. I have never dared to give an audience a week to think of their salvation since. If they were lost, they might rise up in judgment against me. I remember Mr. Sankey singing, and how his voice rang when he came to that pleading verse. Today the Savior calls, for refuge fly. The storm of justice falls, and death is nigh. I have never seen that congregation since. I have hard work to keep back the tears today. I have looked over this audience, and not a single one is here that I preached to that night. I have a great many old friends, and am well, pretty well acquainted in Chicago, but twenty-two years have passed away, and I have not seen that congregation since, and I will never meet those people again until I meet them in another world. But I want to tell you of one lesson I learned that night, which I have never forgotten, and that is when I preach to press Christ upon the people then and there, and to try to bring them to a decision on the spot. I would rather have that right hand cut off than to give an audience now a week to decide what to do with Christ. I have often been criticized. People have said, Moody, you seem to be trying to get people to decide all at once. Why do you not give them time to consider? I have asked God many times to forgive me for telling people that night to take a week to think it over. And if he spares my life, I will never do it again. This audience will break up in a few moments, and we may never meet after today. There's something terribly solemn about a congregation like this. You will notice the pilot was just in the condition of my audience that night. Just in the condition you are in today. He had to decide then and there what to do with Jesus. The thing was sprung upon him suddenly, though I do not think that Jesus Christ would have been a stranger to Pilate. I do not believe that he had preached in Judea for months, and also in Jerusalem, without Pilate having heard of his teachings. He must have heard of the sermons he had preached, for he must have heard of the doctrine he taught. He must have heard of the wonderful parables that he uttered. He must have heard of the wonderful miracles that he performed. He must have heard how Herod had taken the life of his forerunner by having him beheaded, and of the cruel way Herod had treated him. Pilate was no stranger to Jesus of Nazareth. Ever since that night of the great fire I have determined as long as God spares my life to make more of Christ than in the past. I thank God that he is a thousand times more to me than he was twenty-two years ago. I am not what I wish I was, but I am a good deal better than I was when Chicago was on fire. The great fire swept out of existence both the Farwell Hall and the Illinois Street Church. The Sunday night after the meeting, as Mr. Moody went homeward, he saw the glare of flames, and knew it meant ruin to Chicago. About one o'clock, Farwell Hall was burned, and soon his church went down. Everything was scattered. At midnight the fierceness of the fire seemed to be waning, and it was thought that the fire department could gain the upper hand, as they had done the night before. The family retired, but within an hour a loud call was made at to all the residents of the street to hasten their escape. The fire had crossed the river and was rapidly advancing. It was too late to think of saving more than could be carried in the hands. A neighbor took Mr. Moody's two children in his already crowded carriage and made his escape north. A few articles of silver, some valued tokens of friendship, were hastily placed in a baby cart. But there was one article Mrs. Moody's heart was set upon saving. This was a portrait in oil of Mr. Moody by the artist Haley, which hung on the wall in the parlor. It was a gift from the artist, presented to Mrs. Moody after the return from their first trip to Europe in 1867. A free lease of this home, completely furnished, was presented to Mr. Moody at that time by his Chicago friends, and this portrait Mrs. Moody prized above everything else the house contained. A stranger who had entered the house and assisted in taking it from the wall. Calling Mr. Moody, his wife urged him to save it for her. The ludicrous side of the situation at once appealed to him, notwithstanding the terror of the awful evening. "'Take my picture,' he said. "'Well, that would be amusing. Suppose I am met on the street by friends in the same plight as ours, and they say, "'Hello, Moody, glad you have escaped. What's that you have saved, and cling to so affectionately?' "'Wouldn't it sound well to reply, "'Oh, I've got my own portrait.' No entreaty would prevail on Mr. Moody, but the canvas was hastily knocked out of the heavy frame and carried off by Mrs. Moody herself the one relic rescued from their home. 
A bruised face was part of the price paid for this effort, for once on the street there was a constant struggle with the terrific wind. Love won, but only after a fierce battle. The portrait now hangs on the walls of the Northfield home, a reminder of that night of a fiery ordeal. As soon as his wife and family were safe with friends, Mr. Moody devoted himself to relief work. Before long, he started for the East to raise money for the homeless and also for the new church. Within two months, he was back to preaching, and within a year, steps were taken to erect a new permanent building. So I hope you found this interesting. We forget many times how people intersect with history. And so it's interesting to read about the perspective of Moody and Sankey and, and their reaction to things regarding the, the fire. You know, Sankey was very focused on kind of getting himself out. He helped work and uh, worked during the night to try to help other people before the fire became just completely out of control. He could tell it, it was a pointless effort and so went and got his possessions and, and headed away. And then, of course, Moody, uh, not wanting to carry his own portrait through the streets of Chicago, uh, just shows the, the humor of, of the man, which is very interesting. So, you know, we, personally, we haven't got to meet either of these people. There's no one alive today that we can talk to to get to learn about these men. But through the stories people have recorded, we get to learn a little bit about them through stories like this, you know, what they did during the Chicago fire. We get to learn a little bit about their character, about their personalities, and uh, that's what I find interesting. That's what we're hoping to convey here on God's Peculiar People podcast is the human side of people. Many times we kind of glorify people that uh, are from the past. We want to put them up on this pedestal and how great they are, but at the same time, we also want to show more of the human side, you know, not just their, their great preaching, but what they would, how they dealt with a, a tragedy, this great Chicago fire, how they handled themselves, situations, what they did for other people. That's what we want to learn about as well going forward. So hope you found that interesting. Next week, we're going to talk about another musician. As long as things stay on track, uh, we'll talk about another musician. A very interesting one. If you have an idea of who you think that mu musician, I guess not really a musician, a songwriter, put it that way, songwriter, who you think the songwriter is, please leave a comment on my Instagram page on the post for this episode. Tell me who you think we're talking about next week. Be interesting to see if anyone guesses it correctly. But thank you so much for listening to the God's Peculiar People podcast, and we will talk to you again next week.